So today we're really excited to welcome Shalane Flanagan and Elise Kopecki. From being college roommates at Chapel Hill, they've both gone on some very fascinating careers. Shalane has set a lot of records for running. She's run in four Olympic Games now, winning bronze medal in one, and just a few weeks ago she won sixth, leading the American team. She holds a record for the 3,000 meter and 5,000 meter indoors, and for 10K and 15K road races. It's fascinating to me personally how long she's been able to stay on top of her game since so many athletes peak or only do a single Olympics. Elise worked for Nike Running doing digital marketing after she graduated and then did a career change and went to culinary school in New York City. So when we look at this cookbook, we know that the authors have serious chops both in knowing running and in knowing cooking. So it's no wonder it made the New York Times bestseller list. Please welcome Shalane and Elise. Thank you so much, Pete, for having us here at Google. It's such an honor to be here. Um, for me, um, I always admired Google as a company. I worked in digital marketing at Nike for almost 10 years. And if I hadn't been working at Nike, I probably would have wanted to come work at Google. So um, it's awesome to be here and see what an amazing campus you guys have. And today, we've been traveling all over as part of our book tour. We've had a chance to go to some awesome running cities and, and speak to runners and athletes of all levels. And for us, um, this is an opportunity for us to spread such an important message to, to athletes. And what we're teaching people is that there's more to healthy eating than just kale, kale juice. It's uh, also health food is a juicy burger. Um, we want to teach people that health food doesn't have to be bland and boring. It can be really nourishing and really flavorful and keep you satisfied so you're not reaching for junk food. Um, so I'm going to dive into that. But first, I know you guys probably want to hear some stories from Shalane, um, just since she's just returned from an incredible race in Rio. Yeah, so about a couple weeks ago, I ran a little race down in Rio. <laughs> and um, it was an incredible experience. It was my fourth, but I never take it for granted. Getting to wear a USA across my chest, there's so much pride and honor behind that. Um, and the race itself, I had high expectations hoping to land on a podium and wear a nice little necklace around my neck after the race, but that didn't happen. I placed sixth, but we had the highest finish for an American team ever. We went sixth, seventh, and ninth, which was huge. Um, we have a, definitely um, a tough challenge with the East Africans seemed to dominate the distances, so it was quite an accomplishment for us. Um, uh, but I did have to overcome a lot of fear actually for this last race. Um, my Olympic trials um, to qualify for the marathon was in LA, and it was, if any of you have run in the heat before, the heat can be pretty taxing and arduous. And so I never run a heat marathon um, except for in LA at the Olympic trials, and that's obviously um, kind of a tough, tough race because you're trying to make the Olympic team and you have to finish top three. And I ended up um, having a really hard race in the final three miles I barely finished but I hung on for third and so I created a lot of fear the first time I'd ever had to receive an IV after the race and it kind of scarred me that experience running in such um, a deprived dehydration state and you would think at this level I would know everything but really I don't and um, so I had a lot of fear going into Rio because again it was going to be a hot and humid race so I had to overcome a lot of fear um, going into that and um, I reached out to a lot of resources to overcome that fear and uh, got a hydration plan. I relied on my best friend um, to help me come up with that and then a lot of um, research. I went to um, Olympic Training Center and did a hydration analysis and then apparently I'm a, they classified me as an aggressive sweater. Um, <laughs> so so I, I had to probably drink three times more than the rest of the athletes out there but I was able to do that and have a successful marathon. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I talk about fear. Um, Elise and I um, completely made career changes a little bit and collaborated on this beautiful cookbook. And three years ago, that idea started just at my kitchen table while we were eating a delicious meal. And Elise had made some career changes, and I was trying to make the goal to make a fourth Olympic team. And we came up basically over this meal, the idea of writing a cookbook and sharing the knowledge that she gained and how I felt kind of deprived and just um, a burden with my own diet as an athlete. And I wanted to make sure that I was fueling properly. And um, 
So that's how it began. At least I'll share a little bit more of the story. Great, so thanks. Uh, so it's been such an honor for me to write this cookbook. We've known each other for, for 16 years, so to get to write a cookbook together has been a lot of fun. We've been, we were college roommates and teammates, um, and then we both had the chance to move west after graduating from UNC, um, and then working for Nike in different capacities. So I worked in a cubicle while Shalane was down below on the fields running laps, and I always would look out my window and wish I was down there on the field too. Um, <laughs> And anyways, um, the cookbook came to be, we hadn't seen each other in a couple years, and I had been, I had the chance during my career to, my career in marketing to um, work abroad. Um, I worked in, in Geneva, Switzerland um, for a not-to-be-named video game company. And during that time, I got really inspired by the food culture in Switzerland. My diet changed drastically when we moved over there from, um, and I had suffered in college, I suffered from a lot of injuries, and I thought I was a healthy eater. And what I had been eating in college that led to stress fractures and led to me suffering from um, athletic amenorrhea, it went away as soon as I moved to Switzerland and changed my diet. My diet changed from eating white meat chicken breast to whole roasted chicken and from veggie burgers to grass-fed ground beef and from processed fake butter spreads to real butter. And all these decadent foods that we had learned to label in our country as unhealthy actually made me healthier and happier and stronger than ever before. And so I had this realization that I had been depriving myself of these amazing foods that not only tasted, tasted great, but were also um, helping my body absorb vitamins and nutrients so much better than what I had been eating running at a high level in college. Um, and I decided, decided that I wanted to be able to inspire other athletes of all levels. And so I, um, we moved back to the US and I went to study culinary nutrition at a top school in New York City. And after that, I uh, wasn't really sure what I was going to do and how I would get my message out to athletes, um, but had the chance to have dinner together and we reunited, we hadn't seen each other. Um, so that night we were talking and sharing stories from college and catching up on good times. Um, but soon our conversation got more serious and we talked about how many athletes we had seen suffer at every level from our own teammates um, in college to um, a lot of young female athletes um, suffering due to eating mostly a processed foods diet and cal counting calories and feeling like they had to follow a prescription way of eating instead of and seeing food just as fuel instead of seeing it as indulgent nourishment. Um, and so that night I said to um, Shalane, Shalane told me how she always felt while she was marathon training drained and, and hangry and she just felt depleted all the time. And I told her that night, maybe you just need more butter in your life too. Um, so we quickly started revamping her diet and we thought maybe we should write a cookbook together someday so we can get this message out to thousands of runners across the country and, and athletes. And um, we, I never actually thought we would get our courage up to write the book, but, but a, whole, a whole year went by with a lot of text messages back and forth and more dinners together. And finally, um, I, it took my daughter being born for me to realize like this is what I need to do. And, I um, quit, all, quit all my other projects to write our book proposal full time and just went for it. And I tried to ch channel Shalane's uh, energy and competitive edge as much, as much as possible and I poured everything into our book proposal. We sent it out um, not knowing if anyone would ever want to publish our book. We said, well, if nobody wants to publish it, we'll publish it ourselves. Um, so we sent it out to publishers and we ended up with eight bids um, for our book. So we got to pick our first choice publisher, which was um, Rodale, and they've, been, they've done an amazing job of um, making the beautiful book that we had envisioned and sticking to our nutrition philosophy, which is, um, we came to call it indulgent nourishment. And indulgent nourishment, um, we want to prove to people that healthy food um, can be cool. It doesn't have to be bland. And you can eat these amazing foods and, top, and use local seasonal ingredients and top it with olive oil, an olive oil based dressing or buttery sauce. And by eating this way, eating these real foods and fueling yourself, um, you end, you're not, you don't have the cravings anymore for the junk and the bars and the packaged package foods. Um, so we uh, are proud to have the first cookbook for runners that doesn't have calorie counts or nutrition facts and instead we're teaching people to get back in tune with listening to their body's needs. And um, we've been beyond excited to by the amount of media, the media has been really excited about our book. It's appeared in Runner's World and Women's Running Magazine and Outside Magazine and Food and Wine. 
and we were just a couple weeks ago in New York City um, to be on Good Morning America. And best of all, like we had this really high goal that people told us we would never achieve, which was to make the New York Times bestseller list. And, we and we did that. that was just how that happened, <laughs> or how to do it. So we were like, that's the best, right? We're going to shoot for the best. Yeah. So uh, Shalane's competitive, and I channel for competitiveness. <laughs> what else do we do? Yeah. So we really poured our heart and soul into this book. And we want um, not only to inspire people to get into the kitchen, but to inspire people to seek out the best ingredients for their body, to buy local seasonal food. Um, it's not only better for the planet and better for you, it just is more nutrient dense, so it'll leave you feeling satisfied and more energized and not reaching for a sugar fix and not reaching for a coffee fix all day, which I, I noticed you guys have plenty of opportunities for coffee <laughs> fixes. Not that coffee's bad, but... Um, and as part of that, um, we have been, did, been trying to uh, show people and prove um, that dieting doesn't work. Um, a lot of people in our country um, are yo-yo dieting, and every year it's a different kind of diet, whether that's um, a paleo diet or a low-fat diet or juicing or any of these extreme diets. In the end, and the science is there now, and we go into it in the book, but diets just, they're no fun. They cause your body to have um, metabolism swings, and in the end, a lot of people try these diets, and they don't work, and they end up gaining weight. And instead, when you begin to eat real food and um, take the time to get in the kitchen and cook, you'll feel so much better than, than ever before. And one of the things we tell that's kind of our most important message is um, the single greatest thing you can do as an athlete to improve your performance and your health and happiness is, happiness is to learn to cook. And Pete was just showing with us how you guys have a kitchen here where you can learn to cook, which is amazing. So I highly recommend that you take advantage of the cooking classes here. Um, people often tell us, like, I don't have time to cook. I have a full-time job, and I'm training, and I have kids. And if Shalane can get out, can go in the kitchen and cook after a 28-mile training run at high altitude and make homemade sauce and homemade meatballs and a hearty grain salad, then I think the rest of us can too. Um, a lot of people think, well, she must have a private chef cooking all of her meals. I wish. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to hire you. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, um, she's not only cooking for herself, but often going to training camps and cooking for all of her teammates too. Um, so it's pretty impressive to see that. And um, I'll let her talk about some of her favorite recipes in the book um, here in a second. Uh, but on the other, the other thing I wanted to share about um, the good fats. So we really, all of our recipes are full of flavor. And the reason they're so flavorful is because they're so rich in good, healthy fats. And there's been kind of ingrained in our culture over the years, since when we were in high school and college, that fat is bad for you and fat causes heart conditions, and fat causes weight gain, when in fact the opposite is true. Fat prevents weight gain, fat helps regulate re your metabolism, it helps um, you feel energized, it's a great source of energy. Runners get so focused on protein, 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 and carbo loading, and really fat is a great source of energy. It helps um, when you're eating a, a salad or veggies or something um, hearty and healthy and you put fat on top of it. It helps your body absorb all the vitamins and nutrients better. Many vitamins are fat soluble, so you can't um, get the most out of what the foods you're eating without having the fat in your diet. And especially for Google um, employees, fat is so important for brain health, so it keeps you smarter. It prevents um, depression. So anyone who works here probably had a mom that was cooking good meals with healthy fats as a kid, because that's how you guys got here. That was good for your brain health. Um, <laughs> I have a toddler who's two, year, two years old, and she eats this, this is an incredible uh, way of eating, and I know like it's really good for her brain development, so especially for kids where their brains are developing, they need the good fats in their diet. And that's, um, we talk about butter because we love butter, but it's not just butter, you, you have a range of fats. You have coconut oil and olive oil, and um, even fat from really good quality meat sources, so grass-fed ground beef and eggs, and. Um, for us, we prefer dark meat chicken over white meat chicken because it's more, it's got more of the good nourishing fats in there and also more vitamins and minerals. So um, there's lots of sources of great healthy fats. Um, the ones you want to avoid are the ones, the cheap oils that are in packaged foods. And um, there's a lot of packaged foods out there. It's, um, when I say packaged foods, people think of chips and cookies, but there's so much more. It's also the, 
the dressings and the sauces and all the quick fixes that we have in our grocery store to, to get dinner on the table faster. But in our book, we teach people how to make dressings from scratch and sauces and pesto and hummus. And when you're making these foods from scratch, you're able to use the really good oils. Whereas if you're buying hummus in the grocery store, which sounds like a healthy food, it's often made with cheap oils and preservatives, which aren't great for your body. Um, so we really want to inspire people to get in the kitchen and put on an apron and make it have fun with cooking. Um, make it an activity you do on Sunday afternoon to prepare meals for the week and to have stuff prepared in advance. Um, so I'm going to let Shalane share, talk about some of her favorite recipes and how these well, foods have helped the, her. the one favorite that's gained celebrity status. Um, I guess you can, if we were to measure our celebrity status through Instagram at least, um, <coughs> one measuring tool. But, um, so these are our superhero muffins. And as you can see, they look delicious. Um, you can make them with chocolate chips or not. I, I support the chocolate chips. Um, so these are great, really satiating because they have some good butter in it. And they also are made with almond flour, which is a little bit different than your traditional flour. Um, so they're very satiating. They stick in my stomach and I feel like I don't get hungry for hours later, which is great because I don't want to be running around hangry, as Elise describes it. Um, so I'll have these for breakfast. I will have them as a snack. I'll have them for dessert. Um, they're a staple, and people are cooking these up like crazy. Um, they're definitely different because we're tricking people. They taste awesome, but they've got zucchini and carrots in it, too. So um, these are for what we classify as a long Sunday run. These muffins were designed for superheroes like you. They're packed full of veggies and sweetened with maple syrup instead of refined sugar. In addition, almond meal and whole grain oats replace nutrient-stripped white flour. These are my go-to muffins, nourishing and sweetly satisfying for an easy grab-and-run breakfast. And do not fear the butter. Healing up with healthy fats is a great way to start your day. Fat helps transport important vitamins throughout your hardworking body. It will help keep you satisfied longer. Um, so yeah, I recommend these, these are a huge hit for kids, for husbands, wives, um, for parties. They're just, they're amazing. <laughs> Do you want to talk about some of the other foods that you love training for you? Um, yeah, let's see. So I pretty much primarily, you know, a lot of people said once you create this cookbook and you've already tested all these recipes numerous times, I've eaten all of them, it feels like a hundred times each, but I genuinely don't stray from the cookbook. I feel like I can rely on this because I know every ingredient is going to have, is power packed. I, everything I'm putting in my body has a purpose and I like knowing that and I can control that. Um, I always say in athletics you control what you can control because there's a lot of variables that you can't control. So I try to control what I'm putting in for fuel. Um, I'd say another favorite food um, is our high altitude bison meatballs. These are also a huge hit. Um, I had 10 teammates go to the Olympics this summer in Rio and I make these up probably once a week for them. Um, and bison, we eat quite a bit of bison because it's really rich in iron, which is really important for endurance athletes because for an endurance athlete, especially if I train at high altitude, um, I need the red blood cell production and that gives me energy, it transports the oxygen. Uh, so there's thought and stories behind each one of these recipes and on top of being healthy for me, they're delicious, like I crave them. So um, I think in the past, I used to just eat super bland and boring and I wasn't excited to eat my food and I just felt like this burden like I was describing and counting calories and worrying about getting to this race weight which is optimal for performance and I used to stress about it and now I feel like I can indulge in these great foods and not have to worry about my race weight. I find it comes naturally now um, without all the stress of counting. I think it was actually counterproductive. So. I'm just hoping that uh, these recipes can really enhance whatever goals you have, um, athletically or just health-wise. A lot of people ask us, uh, we're gonna have some question, time for questions, but I'll go ahead and ask the question that I know we're gonna get asked. Um, everyone asks us at every stop, every city, well, I don't run 100 miles a week, can I eat these foods? And really, um, this is, <laughs> Even if you're not running, I run 120, so, so sorry. Not a lot of people are like, whoa, well, I don't run that much, so yes. can these really apply to me? Can I really eat that? And the answer is yes. So. This, this is for anyone of any level, what, whether your marathon is a 12-hour day at Google or you're chasing after a toddler as you're running. My running is three to five miles and often with a stroller and not every day. It really varies. And when you eat this way, this is 
this is good food for anyone. When you eat this way, you're just so satisfied and so energized that you're going to want to get out there and do these adventures um, at, on the one hand. And then just real food, isn't, real, real food doesn't cause weight gain. It's all the sugars and processed foods. So if you really make a commitment to sourcing good ingredients and getting in your kitchen and cooking, then yes, you can eat this way too. Um, so yeah, if anyone has questions, we have time for answering. So we have a mic set up right here for questions. Please form a line and ask your questions. Um, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, the most important question for me is, like, how do you source the, you know, what do you call a good food? Like, for example, um, beef. So uh, I've tried different kinds of beef before, and uh, there's only um, uh, one source of beef I had that was really good. Uh, but that's from Hawaii, and it's really hard to get to. Yeah, so you, it, you guys are really blessed with access in Seattle to incredible ingredients. Um, so I would really highly recommend getting to know your farmers at your local farmer's market. Um, and they buying direct from a farmer is going to give you the best source of beef. Um, when you go to the grocery store, you have the options um, of organic. Some higher-end grocery stores, like natural food grocery stores, will also have a grass-fed. Option, so I always choose the grass fed option. Um, organic labeling is a bit misleading because it's gotten to be so mainstream that now you have mass produced organic foods. So anytime that you can get your food closer to the source, and in Seattle you have amazing um, access to local farmers markets, that's the best bet if you can make a commitment to go to a farmers market once a month. But even if you don't have time to go to the farmers market, um, a lot of um, farms will deliver direct. Um, so even where I live in Bend, Oregon, um, there's a CSA, which is a Community Supported Agriculture Farm Share, and they will deliver, I don't know if Google has deliveries directly here, but in Bend you can have um, produce and meat delivered direct to your office um, or to your home, which is an awesome opportunity. Um, and a lot of food labels are really like misleading. You see like grass-fed and cage-free and all of this, um, but when you're buying direct to the farmer, you don't have to stress when you're getting it from small local farms, they're, they're the ones who are committed to taking care of their land because they want to be able to pass their farm down to generations. We have a great source that we, a farmer we love. Um, it's Pine Mountain Ranch in Bend, Oregon, just outside of where I live. And they have a website, um, Pine Mountain Ranch, and you can order an amazing bison and yak and have it delivered, uh, mailed with like ice packs. And, Yak, you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my daughter loves yak, my two year old. Did you say Pine Mountain? Pine, uh, Pine Mountain Ranch. Okay, we're going to Washington. So they deliver to Google, but they don't include meats. I don't even add vegetables and fruits. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, just keep on asking, but I, I do have other questions. Let's have to ask. So you mentioned the dark meat chicken. So what does that mean? I, I never heard. Chicken thighs. So you have the chicken. Um, so when I buy chicken, I buy the whole chicken, and I get it from a good, uh, reputable uh, farmer or a reputable grocery store. Um, even like Whole Foods, you can buy the whole chicken and use every part of it, and that's the best way to eat meat um, because you get the the chicken. The dark meat is the thigh and the leg. Um, but also, I use every part of the chicken. So we don't eat a lot of meat, but we definitely have meat every day, and we eat it as like a, a side. So we have a lot of vegetables, and then the meat is a smaller side dish. Um, and just it's, when you use every part of it, you can make bone broth, which is an incredibly mineral-rich, nourishing tonic, which is great for um, f f fighting inflammation and for recovery and for um, preventing. We're getting into flu season, so we have a recipe in here for bone broth, and then you can make like a chicken stew, which is full of ginger and garlic, is really good for boosting your immune system. Um, I also have a question about the, um, I don't know, I, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of people, but, um, so there's meat, there's veggies, but uh, um, we also eat a lot of flour and rice, you know, how do you source uh, those kind of things, like uh, from Costco or from, you know, uh, Whole Foods, or where, where do you source them? Because we need to uh, use a lot of them, like on a regular basis. My favorite source for whole grains is Bob's Red Mill, and you can find it at a lot of most, even like Safeway or mainstream grocery store, you can find Bob's Red Mill. They're based in Oregon, and they have um, all kinds of whole grains, like um, you can get farro and quinoa, and you can get um, like ground flours too for baking. We have a lot of wholesome treats in our book, and they're made with the whole grain flours. Um, rice, I would say, 
we like to stick to short grain brown rice. Brown rice is more nutritious. I like short grain just for the texture. And you can find that in the bulk section at any health food store. Thanks, that's a good question. So I have a question about uh, during and post-workout nutrition. You know, I find that it's really hard, obviously, while you're running and then immediately afterwards, you know, the last thing I want to do after a long run is sit in the kitchen for 20 minutes cooking something. Do, do you pre meat food or how do you handle that? Yeah. Um, concerning while you're running, so do you like, do you consume a sports drink or gel? Or I, I've been using like power bars. Power bars, okay. I'm not super happy with it, but yeah. Really um, well, we have some treats in here that are great yeah. for like while you're running as well as post run. Um, my favorite that we have are banana chews, um, which are just a natural bananas, um, but they're cooked a little bit and they, they're chewy. So it's like, you know, you see a lot of the sports gummies. So it replaces the synthetic kind of gummies and the simple sugars that are not as great for you. Um, we also have what we call Giddy Up Energy Bars, and they're made with dates and a variety of dried fruit and um, what else nuts. Is it? nuts in it. So um, dates and nuts are a great for, like, source to fuel you. Um, when I'm competing, I, I just drink a sports drink, and so that's... Uh, but that's necessary, like there's times and place where you're drinking the sports drink. Otherwise, I'm drinking usually like a coconut water most of the time or just simple water. Um, but I get you after a run, the last thing you want to do is get in the kitchen. Um, so sometimes I'll try to like prepare a little bit and cook maybe half my meal prior. Um, but right after a run, I usually have um, our beet smoothie. Sounds weird. It's delicious. And so that really just gets something in immediately because you have kind of a window to kind of refuel and you'll make you feel a lot better. And if you refuel right away, you're going to be a little bit more motivated to get in the kitchen. So my go-to though, once I get in the kitchen, are just some veggies and scrambled eggs. Really simple. Um, but yeah, at least you have more. Uh, yeah, so a smoothie, if you're not hungry right after you run because you're so thirsty, a smoothie is a great solution. And especially if you're putting um, other ingredients in there besides fruits and veggies to balance out all the, you don't want to just have this big sugar rush so putting almond butter in there for the good fat and whole milk yogurt is amazing like getting a good organic whole milk yogurt and um, mixing that into your smoothie is, is great awesome thank you mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a question on your views on carbs so on the one hand it's the fuel like we do carb loading before a marathon and uh, probably during the training, and on the other hand, there are a lot of views against carbs, like the, I, I read the book from Phil Maffetone and the big book of D endurance, that book have some extreme views, but it does help a lot. It also have the quick recipe there. Uh, it, he totally against using carbs and even against carb loading before a marathon. Uh, and he also recommends things like uh, grass-fed uh, grass beef from local farms, so, What's your view on, like, on carbs? If I were to just ask all the women that I compete against, men, like in the Olympics who are running the marathon, endurance right. athletes, none of them would not consume carbs. Everyone would be like, Car they need carbs. You need glycogen to, right, to right. do an endurance event. So that being said, I would not do the no carbs. We're not really into any trend at all. Like, we just think that what you eat on a daily basis, a weekly basis, and in your training, for example, is what you should be fueling basically before the race. So I will add in a little bit of extra carbs the week of the race, but I don't go hog wild. I don't go and sit and have like a giant bowl of pasta the night before. I think I would spend half my racing at a quarter dawn. <laughs> no joke. So you have to like everything in moderation. Anything extreme is not what we're about. Everything is all about moderation. Um, so we find that it is important to do the carbo loading, but it's it's very small. So like more more of my snack snacks throughout the week will be carbo okay. um, oriented, but otherwise I eat exactly the way I would eat through my training. But do I need to uh, limit carb uh, uh, intake no. to lose weight? Because no, no, no. Carbs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's a big difference between processed carbs and whole food carbs. So okay. you do want to avoid the processed carbs, <laughs> like the um, white flour and white sugar and breads and um, all the packaged foods out there are made with really highly processed carbs that have no nutrients. But the carb carbohydrates we use in our books are all, are complex carbs like sweet potatoes and whole grains and all these things that are going to be balanced energy versus these um, unhealthy spikes that um, not only cause you to not feel great but will also lead to 
weight gain if you're eating a lot, a lot of that. So it is good to avoid the, the processed carbs. So I'm going to guess, I'll just follow up a little bit more on that specific question again on carbs. Like, so you as an endurance athlete, so you consume carbs, but wheat, like not white carbs, so pasta, but like wheat pasta and... Yes, uh, yeah. Like yeah. Not um, white uh, rice, but, but uh, brown rice. My favorite carbohydrate is a sweet potato. Um, so, you know, the night before I run the Boston Marathon, I was eating a sweet potato because, and the least can explain why, the sweet potato is a great source of a carbohydrate as opposed to, like, we were talking about the strict flours that really have, provide no nutrition. So, the wheat pasta is kind of misleading packaging. Um, same with wheat bread. If it says whole wheat pasta or whole wheat bread on the outside of the package, if you flip to the back and look at the actual ingredients, if the first ingredient is just wheat flour, it's not actually whole wheat. So, when you're buying bread, you want the first ingredient to be whole wheat flour, not just wheat flour. And there's a lot of other things like that with misleading packaging. Um, we, we eat pasta, we're not gluten free, but um, but we don't eat like a big mound of pasta. Instead, we will have a small serving of pasta with a lot of sauce that the sauce is packed with veggies and meat and all the good stuff. Um, and then other good carbohydrates for runners is um, brown rice or Shalane's favorite is wild rice. And we have a, a wild rice salad in here that's amazing. Um, or farro or quinoa. There's lots of other great sources. Um, but we're not going to say don't eat pasta because we love pasta too. Yeah. <laughs> What about dairy? Yeah, for that, like again, like at some athletes say, say like, oh, like, don't consume dairy, you know, yogurt, milk, uh, cheese. Dairy. Dairy, yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so dairy is pretty hard to digest. A lot of runners are sensitive to dairy and sensitive to gluten. Um, a lot of runners suffer from GI distress because um, when you're running, your blood is flowing away from your digestive system and going to your hardworking muscles. Um, so dairy can be very hard to digest because of how it's processed in our country. Um, it's very, it's um, homogenized and ultra pasteurized, so they're heating it to these extreme temperatures, so it's killing off all the good probiotics and enzymes, um, which makes it really difficult to break down the lactose in the dairy. And so we have, in our book, we don't use cream or milk. Instead, we use um, dairies that are easier to digest, like whole milk yogurt, which have probiotics in it, and aged cheeses like Parmesan. When they age the cheese, it has it um, has the enzymes and it's a lot easier to digest. Um, we also love goat cheese. It doesn't have the lactose that's in dairy that a lot of people have problems with. So, Shalyn, you don't drink coffee with milk? Coffee with milk? No. Oh, no, I do. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but not a lot. I usually, I prefer actually almond milk most of the time. So. She loves oh, my coffee. Loves coffee. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that yeah, you used to count your calories a lot and like you wouldn't be satisfied with the food or happy with the food and once you, you change to this diet, uh, not diet, I mean way of eating, yeah. uh, it helped a lot and you don't change your diet much. Can you elaborate more on like how much you change your eating close to a race or if you change at all? Yeah, so like Elise helped me realize that the way our culture and how we kind of grew up, we were ingrained to have everything low fat. So like in my fridge, it would be low fat yogurt and um, I would have, you know, fake butter spice. Thinking this was all healthy, mind you. Here I was, I was thinking I was doing myself, I was doing a good job, taking care of myself. Um, but it always left me hungry and not feeling satiated. I always felt like I was constantly hungry and just could never feel full. And there was a reason why, it's because I was eating all, everything so low fat and a lot of low fat foods just put pump in a lot of sugar. So I, my body was just burning it and just ripping through it. And so I was feeling hungry all the time, which is not fun to run around hungry. And I have a lot of training. I run close to, you know, sometimes 20 miles a day. And that left me just not in a good place. So I felt like, um, you know, with counting calories and having to eat all these kind of bland, boring foods, I just felt like unmotivated and uninspired to eat and uninspired to get in the kitchen and cook. And once Elise taught me how to integrate, like making my own salad dressings with some really good oils, um, eating chicken thighs instead of all the white breast, um, having nice buttery sauces on my pasta, I just started to feel like it was more indulgent. I was enjoying my food more, and I just felt like I didn't need to count calories because I was just my weight was naturally finding a good place, and I didn't feel like I had to stress about it anymore. And she told me that she's like, the only numbers you 
you should be concerned about or what your watch is reading, and what your splits are for your workouts, how many miles you're running a day, worry about those numbers, abandon the idea of counting calories, and plus on top of it, I couldn't count calories because all the foods I was eating were natural foods. I don't know how many calories are in each, you know, um, and an apple necessarily, every apple is different, and when you're eating whole foods, there's no need to read the nutrition label. So it just completely opened up um, my way of looking at food, and it's been like a huge relief, and I have found that here I am at age 35, and I feel rejuvenated, and I made my fourth Olympic team, and that's hard to do at my age. There's not many 35-year-old Olympians, and um, I feel like it's because I've changed my diet, the way, well, I shouldn't say diet, my way of eating now. I have a follow-up to that. Uh, so sometimes when I'm in heavy training, I wake up like hungry, like in the middle of the night, like four or three. Do you have this kind of stuff, or do you change your diet when yeah, you? Yeah, I used to. That used to, I used to always have like a snack by my bed because I would wake up and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry, I can't wait till breakfast. I have to like grab a snack right now so I used to lose like 15 pounds before I got to Olympics. Um, you know, it, it, athletes, it's like bars are always like pushed at you all the time. Um, so now I go to bed and I'm full throughout the night and I'm, I'm ready to eat in the morning, but I'm not like in the middle of the night, so my, the hunger pains aren't waking me up, which would happen a lot when I'm training hard. Yeah. Before I ask my question, can I invite you ladies to sit? Oh. <laughs> You've been standing while the rest of us have been. <laughs> um, so uh, I was kind of curious, because there's a lot of trends out there, and one particular one, uh, I have a friend who really got excited, is Soylent. Uh, what is your take on Soylent? Soy? Soylent, it's, uh, uh, never mind. I guess if you, if, that, if you're not, <laughs> it's a, the idea is that they're sourcing a bunch of um, uh, sugars and fats from different places and then they put them in a bottle or a powder, right? So it's supposed to be yeah. pre-balanced, all that stuff. That's frightening. <laughs> <laughs> There's more to eating than just like the nutrients. There's um, the act of eating and sitting down to a meal and being part of the, the community and the social aspect of eating food and cooking um, wakes up your digestive system. There's so much more to eating than just like drinking down nutrients. So that those products scare me. They're also really highly processed in a lab and they're not. Um, it's not real food. So yeah, I'm not crazy about that. Mm -hmm. I've never even heard of it. <laughs> Ask a non-food question, <laughs> like just a like, couple of questions to uh, Shalane mm -hmm. like, about running mostly. Oh, my first question was, can you comment, like what is your opinion on the, like the recent amazing world, uh, world record by Almaya for the 10K? Like what's your opinion there? Yeah. Like a very, like. Um, it's like mind blowing. I can't even actually even conceptualize. So he's asking about in the Olympics um, in the 10,000 meter, which I have a bronze medal from um, Beijing, China, in the 10,000 meters. And um, but in Rio this summer, um, there was a woman from Ethiopia who ran uh, the world record in the race. And it was I like, couldn't believe my eyes watching her. It's beyond my comprehension. And Shalane is an American world uh, American record for NK. Yeah. Um, and so she ran. She ran. Um, half of the race faster than I could run, like, so at 5K, uh, or 5,000 meters, she's ran her first 5,000 or her second 5,000 faster than I've ever run one. So I can't even conceptualize. Um, it was just an outstanding performance. Um, unfortunately, with athletics, sometimes what seems unbelievable is unbelievable. Um, I don't know what to think about it, um, just because uh, as maybe many of you read over the summer, there was a lot of um, doping stories and, um, you know, with Russia being um, extracted from the Olympics and not allowed. So it's hard to, it's just hard to know what is um, real or not real. However, I will say there's not many 10,000 meter races and opportunities to run really fast. So maybe um, she really just is that good, but we'll find out. But she was, it was, it was so impressive. Yes. <laughs> And can you just talk a little bit what is next for you? Like, more marathons Athletic. next? Yeah. Yes. Running wise, yes. <laughs> um, well, I'm taking a nice little break um, on this book tour. It's fun to do something um, different. I, my lifestyle is very monastic when I am training for a marathon. It's three months of a lot of dedication. It's run, eat, sleep, 
running sleep repeat. It's very much the same thing. It's what I call Groundhog Day. If any of you have seen that movie, that's my life when I'm training for a marathon. It's not very eventful. Uh, so it's fun for me to do other activities and engage with people. I feel like when I come out of marathon training, I'm in like shock and I don't know how to even communicate. It's like, do I even know English? Like, it's, it's, uh, it's a little scary. So it's fun to just be inspired um, by my running community and the cooking world. Uh, it motivates me to get back to my training by taking a break. And so probably come December and January, I'll be back at the grind of running uh, sleep. And I have aspirations. My, my love affair with running is uh, in Boston. I love the Boston Marathon. I grew up there. So I may show up in Boston next April. That may be part of my plan. Um, but beyond that, I don't know. I'm taking one race at a time. Um, a lot of athletes think in four-year chunks. But right now, I'm just going to go month by month. So. So I want to ask about morning runs. You may have the luxury not to have to deal with this, but but how do you deal when you're trying to get a long run in in the morning? You know, do you wake up at 4 a.m. to eat and then go back to sleep for a few hours, or um, if I'm just doing training, like yeah, a like, long run training run. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I I like to eat about 90 minutes prior to the start of a run, um, and I know that that maybe is like a luxury for me because that's my job. Uh, but so if like, for example, if you were wanting to start your run, what, at like 5 a.m., you're saying, and you wanted to get in before work, or? or yeah, or, you know, I have family or yeah, other, other commitments, you know, you want to do like three hours at like, you know, 7 a.m., 6 a.m. Yeah, I mean, the key is, um, the key in the morning, and this is maybe a little bit too much information, is to get up and get, get moving so that you're not going to have any GI issues out on the trail and having to make a pit stop. So that's usually what most runners are like, let's get up like an hour before to try to get some food in, make sure that you've made your bathroom stop and you can head out on the trail on the road and be good to go. Um, so I usually get up about like an hour before, but sometimes that's hard to do if it's dark and cold. And um, But usually on the ride to like where or drive, or if I'm going to go run the drive, um, or run drive to go run, I will take like a smoothie or one of our superhero muffins and eat that kind of right before I get out there. So, yeah. If you don't have time, like for breakfast, my, I, I run early before um, my husband leaves for work and before I start working. And um, so I don't, at that hour at 6 a.m., I'm not hungry. So I'll just um, get up and have some coconut water um, mixed with water, like deep diluted with water, and either coffee or tea, and um, like a couple of dates just for some quick energy. But a three hour run is different. Like I don't, I usually run less than that. So um, you definitely want to get some, some fuel in you, and, and dates would be a good quick glucose source. All right, that's the end of our talk. We're going to have a, a book signing over at that table over there. There's still some books available for purchase over here. And everybody, please give a warm thank you to Shane and Elise. Thank you.